Welcome back. So uh, again, my name is uh, Joe Becker of the Stanford uh, Emergency Medicine International, and I have with me Dr. Mahadevan, also from our uh, Emergency Medicine Department. He has our expert analysis discussant of uh, our fever cases. Um, so welcome, Dr. Mahadevan. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here. So uh, without further ado, we'll jump right into the case. And as we uh, discussed earlier when we presented this case, we have the case of two supposedly trauma patients, uh, Donna and Catherine, that are brought in after a, a motor vehicle accident. Uh, and one of the two uh, has altered mental status. So we'll go ahead and watch this video and then um, just answer some of the associated uh, questions. Okay, fellas, heads up, let's go. Donna Gallagher, unrestrained teen driver, rejected in her car flip, hit a jogger coming in on the next rig, GCS 7, BP 90 pounds. Rig, trauma one. Passenger has facial injuries from airbag and shoulder pain, vital stable. Yeah, we see you got it. What's your name, sweetie? Kevin Ochaski. Oh, I feel ya. I used to be Abigail Wazinski. My friends call me Katie O. Donna, can you hear me? BP 75 systolic, pulse 130. How are we doing in here? Nothing in the belly, no tampon on. Why is she hypotensive? Necromosis on the thighs. Distal extremities, too. She's in DIC. She has to be hemorrhaging somewhere to cause DIC. All right, let's get her to the scanner. Oh, her IV sites are oozing. She needs platelets and FFP. No, not with this blood shortage. We can't give her a last platelet, she'll just chew them up. She's unresponsive, she's bleeding everywhere. She could have a head bleed. We don't know that. All right, can someone give me a gram of acetaminophen? Okay, so based on this clip that we just watched, um, Dr. Mahadevan, can you help us discuss, kind of, and elucidate what are the important actions uh, initially when you're evaluating an undifferentiated, chronic, critically ill patient? So, what, how do we approach these patients? Very stressful. Yeah. So, you want to have an organized approach to the undifferentiated, critically ill patient. So, generally, as we've discussed, uh, the first step is going to be um, assessing their level of consciousness and their general appearance. And so we can see that this young lady is uh, not making any noise, her eyes are closed, so she's not really interactive with her environment. And then the next step would be to assess the ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. Okay, great. All right, and so in doing that, in a patient like this, um, what, uh, what would kind of you have, expect to have some of your staff doing at the same time, kind of what, um, as you prepare to have this patient intervene upon in whatever way they need to be uh, taken, taken further? Sure. Um, as we always discuss, while one person is focused on the ABCs, you can have other staff members sort of contemporaneously addressing other issues, such as uh, placing the patient on oxygen, establishing an IV, putting the patient on a cardiac monitor, and in, in a, a patient who is altered like this, uh, checking a blood glucose, doing all these things sort of simultaneously. Uh, it doesn't have to be sequential while the physician is doing the primary assessment, trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, the rest of the staff can be assisting with all these very important tasks in the undifferentiated, critically ill patient. Great, okay, so absolutely. So kind of almost a cookie cutter approach. You know, this was a trauma patient, but I'm sure these kinds of uh, measures should be taken even in uh, medically ill patients, septic patients, or head injured patients, or what have you. This is a kind of a good approach uh, for all patients in this situation. Yeah, if you have this sort of organized approach and you do the same things for the same sick patients every time, you won't forget anything, which is, that's important, and that's really the key, not forgetting something really important. Great, great, great. All right, so the second question based on that same clip is, uh, the patient, Donna, appears to be in shock. What do the characters in this scene do to differentiate between the causes of shock? And perhaps, Dr. Mahadevan, it might be good just to kind of a short, quick one-liner about shock. What is it? What are we talking about here? We have patients in shock. Uh, what, what is that? Uh, how is that defined? Yeah, shock is inadequate perfusion of the vital organs. And the vital organs typically are going to be your brain and your heart. And so if you're not getting enough um, nutrients and blood flow and oxygen to your tissues, uh, you are in shock. It isn't defined by a heart rate or a blood right. pressure. It's really inadequate perfusion of your vital organs. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, in this particular instance, uh, the, pre <coughs> the presumption is going to be that this young lady was in a car accident and the shock is presumably is going to be as a result of some traumatic injury. So she comes in, she's altered, she has a low blood pressure, so our, our focus is going to be on you know, traumatic causes right. of shock. Appropriately so. However, what we do know, having taken care of a lot of patients and seen a lot of presentations, that sometimes there's an event that occurs prior to the accident that, that may be the reason for the shock. Take the elderly patient that has a heart attack and crashes their car, or a seizure, loses control and crashes their car. 
in some circumstances, in some uh, instances, there is something else contributing to the shock that we may not be aware of because we're assuming that it's all related to trauma. Sure, good. No, very true, absolutely. We, uh, we sometimes have a kind of a laser focus on the, the, the cause of the uh, illness that we see when in fact there are other contributors. Uh, it seemed as though they were trying uh, unsuccessfully to, to address or identify the cause of this patient's shock. What were some of the kinds of things that were being done in that clip mm -hmm. uh, uh, to identify where this shock might come from? Sure. Um, they were obtaining vital signs, so they were trying to determine the patient's heart rate and blood pressure. Uh, we heard the doctor had uh, performed a fast exam, an ultrasound, looking both within the peritoneal cavity and also around the heart to see if there was bleeding there. Uh, trying, again, trying to determine a, a traumatic cause of the shock. Other things that you would do would be to do a, a proper assessment of the patient. So look and feel their extremities. Are, are, is there delayed capillary refill? When you palpate the extremities, are they cool? Are, are, when you look at them, are they cyanotic? These would be... Uh, things that would suggest that the patient is in shock. Great. Give me tablets, please. Secure her airway. Let's see what we find on CT. By then, it could be too late. Okay, Katie, you move your head from side to side. Does that hurt? It's just a little stiff. Okay. And I hurt all over. And your forearm took a step. I must have hit him on the dashboard or something. Now, do you remember what happened? We were at the mall. No school? It was the last day before spring break, so we cut. But Donna got a headache, and she said she wanted to go home. Okay. Keep on my finger. The light really hurts. The airbag could have scratched your cornea. BP 115 over 80, pulse 104. Okay, I'm gonna press on your abdomen. Let me know if this hurts. She fainted on the way home. I tried to stop the car, but I couldn't. Chest x-ray, shoulder series, icon UA, and visual acuity. I'll set up the sleep lamp. Thank you. And then the car was upside down. I looked over at Donna, but she wasn't there anymore. It's okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> as this clip progresses, we learn more about the incident and the traumatic uh, uh, injuries that were sustained. Um, brings up a very interesting question. As we discussed, this is a, a case about fever. So, these are trauma patients something else must be going on. So how can the emergency provider make the correct diagnosis in situations such as the one presented in this video? It's very complex. We oftentimes miss components of the history or, or the actually examination. Yeah, we've got two patients, one that's really sick, and our patient who can actually provide a history. And as we learn more about what actually happened to the really sick patient, we find out that she had a fever, she developed a headache, and over the course of driving, she lost consciousness, and that's why they crashed the car and she was ejected. So uh, there was something going on before the actual traumatic event. And uh, without that history, the assumption is always going to be this was just a car crash, and um, they were involved in the car crash, and again, as we mentioned before, that her symptoms are all related to the trauma. Now, as we get a little bit more history, we are thinking about other conditions, other reasons for the patient to be in shock and in addition to trauma. Right. It seems like this is a, you know, a great uh, example of a case in which, you know, even thinking back on my own experiences in the emergency room, when we can make a very common error in, in terms of uh, tunnel visioning mm -hmm. on, on one particular finding or historical feature and then closing our mind to additional uh, pieces of information as they, as they arise. Yeah, uh, as we've seen over and <laughs> over again, um, it's very dangerous for, uh, for physicians or for any healthcare provider to get focused on one diagnosis and ignore all the other information that may be pointing in another direction. And we've all been guilty of this at some point in our careers. And what you learn with time and experience is as you gain more information, some new findings, then you want to incorporate them into the story and an explanation of what might be going on with the patient. And I think that's particularly important in this case. All right, all right. Did you reach my parents? They're on their way in, so are Donna's. Is she okay? She's got some really good doctors taking care of her. Can I get something for my headache? Sure. Temp is up, 101.8. Okay. 600 of ibuprofen. And about my bruises, when will they go away? They've spread. Yeah.
Abby. Okay, Juni, put on a mask. All the lab for stat blood cultures hang two grams of stat triaxone. Ivy, make sure she stays in isolation. Don't worry, Mr. Highsmith, you'll be back jogging in no time. Luca! Time of death, 1217. It's meningococcemia. Sure? My patient has rapidly progressing purpur and fever, and I bet this one is too. It's DIC from trauma. Yeah, I don't think so. My girl complained of headaches, stiff neck, and sensitivity to light. I'll call infection control. I put her in isolation, start her on ceftriaxone. We need immediate prophylaxis for all hospital staff exposed to these patients. It's a lot of people. We're all at risk. OK, so as the story develops mm -hmm. and we get more further information, we learn that likely there, there was some component of traumatic injury here, obviously, but that the cause of this accident may have been something else. And the concern is that this is a case of uh, meningococcal meningitis mm -hmm. and so um so it brings up a good point i mean this certainly is a cause of fever um what is how do we diagnose meningitis what is the role of the spinal tap or the lumbar puncture in sure. in, in, uh, in uh, making this diagnosis so um there are sort of three different types of illness you might see with uh, meningococcus meningococcus you might see uh, meningitis you might see a bacteremia, meningococcemia, or you might see a combination of the two. And it just depends on the particular patient. Some patients present just with the meningitis, a small portion of them present just with the bacteremia, and a lot of them present with both. And in this particular case, with regard to making the diagnosis, clearly the way to think about it, the, way, the reason that this doctor suddenly thought about it was putting the story together. So fever, headache, altered mental status and now this rash that is rapidly spreading all are suggestive and, and, and a patient dying precipitously from this combination of findings and showing some late manifestations of it. Um, uh, DIC was mentioned earlier, disseminated intravascular coagulation. So all of these things put together are highly suggestive of uh, meningococcemia and meningitis and the role of lumbar puncture is in one, uh, identifying if the patient does have meningitis, it's the way that we make the diagnosis, and then identifying the organism. And the way that we can do that is removing some fluid from around the spine through lumbar puncture and examining it under a microscope to look to see if we can identify the organism that might be responsible, um, looking to see what kinds of cells, are there white blood cells, are there red blood cells, staining it, um, and checking things like uh, protein and glucose and putting that whole group together and trying to see if it fits a particular pattern. Is it bacterial? Is it viral? Is it something like tuberculosis? Um, um, the last thing that we can do obviously is um, send it for culture, which is very important because um, until you know for sure what you're treating, it's tough. You, you always make your best guess, but once we have the culture in hand, we can say definitively that we're treating something and that our treatment's going to work. So is it, is it necessary to do a lumbar puncture on every patient that you're suspected of having meningitis? Is there any other way of making this diagnosis? It's kind of a, first of all, kind of a time-consuming procedure. Second of all, it can be difficult to perform, particularly in a patient who's critically ill or, or uh, altered. Yeah, unfortunately, it is the way that we make the diagnosis. So we certainly su suspect the diagnosis based on the history and the physical exam, and then we confirm the diagnosis through lumbar puncture. Okay, so you basically have to do a lumbar puncture to make the diagnosis of meningitis. Absolutely. All right, very good. So next question. Is it necessary to wait for the results of a lumbar puncture before initiating antibiotic treatment? So in this clip, we didn't see anybody talking about doing a lumbar puncture. Mm -hmm. We did see the provider order some ceftriaxone, some rocephin, uh, some antibiotic for the meningitis. Is that going to perturb or, or change the results of our lumbar puncture? Is this an appropriate way to manage this patient? Sure. So the con there's two competing concerns. One is obviously the, mo the foremost concern is concern for the patient. And if this patient is suffering from meningitis, especially with Neisseria meningitidis, the only therapy that's going to save this patient is antibiotics. And so the key is getting antibiotics on board as soon as possible. As we mentioned, we won't know if it's meningococcus until we do the lumbar puncture. And so you've got competing um, diagnostic and therapeutic agendas. And the, but the reality is the, the, the one that should take uh, precedence is administering antibiotics. And we know this because you can give antibiotics and it shouldn't affect the lumbar puncture culture okay. results 
for up to four hours. So the concern is if I give antibiotics, I'll kill the organism and I'll never know what was causing the meningitis when in fact you have up to four hours to perform that lumbar puncture after giving the antibiotics and it's not going to affect those culture results. And this has been uh, proven in the literature. Right. So it sounds like really we have no excuse for to delay therapy and these patients really should get uh, antimicrobial treatment as quickly as possible. If they're this sick, Absolutely. When they're not so sick and you're not really sure about the diagnosis, then you have more time sure, to perform sure. the lumbar puncture before giving antibiotics. But if your suspicion is that the patient has bacterial meningitis, you need to give antibiotics as soon as they hit sure. the door. So we do that pretty often, huh? I mean, we have a critically ill patient. We're not quite sure what's going on, although we do have kind of a differential diagnosis. And so when we have someone who's super ill like this and with some pretty dangerous things on their differential, we tend to treat them empirically for some of this stuff, don't we? I mean, we don't have all of our information, but yet we're still going to give all the we're going to give the patients some some therapeutics. Yeah, remember we talked about evaluate, think, and act. And there are some times when you have to act first, um, and so that action is administering ad antibiotics, and then we can complete our evaluation and think about it a little bit more. But give the antibiotics first. That's Absolutely. the most important thing that you can do. All right. So empiric therapy. We discussed, we discussed. And in this case, uh, the, the doctor mentioned cef ceftriaxone. So if you're concerned about Neisseria meningitidis, uh, a third generation cephalosporin is what we, we <coughs> commonly use. If you knew that it was Neisseria, other antibiotics that could be used, if you knew for sure that that's what it was, would be penicillin or chloramphenicol. But most commonly, we're going to use a third generation cephalosporin like cef ceftriaxone. Good. OK, great. All right. So we learned that basically it is not necessary to perform the LP before giving antibiotics and that really because of the critical nature of this patient's illness and the fact that she has a very serious bacterial infection, administering antibiotics as soon as possible is important. And then you have, sounds like about four hours mm -hmm. to uh, perform the lumbar puncture, which is still a priority, uh, but just should not delay the, the provision of um, what in this case may be life-saving uh, treatment. Absolutely. All right, good. So moving on to the next question. So as we learned, uh, this case seems to be one of Neisseria meningitidis, bacterial meningitis. Um, so what other patient, what other treatment can we provide for this patient? I mean, we've talked about the antibiotics. Uh, what else can be done to help save this, uh, this poor uh, patient? So the most important thing is early administration of antibiotics, which we've talked about. So antibiotics, most important. And then really, if, if you know that it's Neisseria meningitidis, the only other therapy that can be provided is really supportive therapy. So IV fluids, antipyretics, um, placing the patient in isolation so they don't uh, infect other um, patients, careful monitoring to see if they're responding to our therapy. Uh, that's really all that we can do. Um, steroids are used in uh, some instances of meningitis where they've been shown to be of benefit. With regard to Neisseria meningitidis, specifically dexamethasone uh, does not provide any additional benefit when you're treating meningitis. However, um, <coughs> if we're talking about strep pneumo or pneumococcus in adults and as a cause of meningitis, um, steroids are beneficial. And then when we're talking about children and Haemophilus influenza type B meningitis, obviously, that would be another instance where steroids would be of benefit in addition to supportive care and antibiotics. Gotcha. All right. So good. So, so it sounds like, as we discussed, antibiotics are crucial to get on board very quickly quickly in this patient's case, as uh, is supportive care, obviously providing the patient with fluids, any kind of vital sign support they may need, controlling their fever, and providing good monitoring. And then steroids, this interesting question of steroids. Uh, it sounds like if we are aware of what the organism is or have a strong suspicion that the organism is either strep pneumo in the mm -hmm. case of adults or H influenza and mm -hmm. in the case of children, mm -hmm. that steroids do have a role. But in this case with Neisseria or in the undifferentiated patient, it sounds like we would not just routinely give steroids. Agree. Good. All right. Okay. So, next question. Uh, why is it important to maintain universal precautions for all patients and to be vigilant for diagnoses that require higher levels of, of isolation? Sure. So, again, we, we don't want to become a patient ourselves, and we're dealing with some very deadly illnesses sometimes in the emergency department, including uh, Neisseria meningitidis and uh, meningococcemia meningitis. And so, the key is really to protect yourself and protect your staff. Uh, and protect other family members, and uh, do things like uh, ensure that there's no spread of illness through droplet, precaution, uh, through droplet precautions. So um, wearing a mask, wearing a gown, 
putting the patient in, in a room where they can't, their, their secretions can't come in contact with other patients or other staff members would be some of the things that we might do. Um, and then other ways of protecting ourselves, obviously thinking about things like um, prophylaxis, course, bacterial prophylaxis. Good. So it sounds like they were talking a little bit about prophylaxis and isolation uh, for the patient as well as the kind of healthcare providers that came in contact with this patient. What is prophylaxis in this case? I mean, let's say that I care for a patient who eventually is diagnosed with Neisseria meningitis. What should I be worried? Should I take medication and sh should I be concerned about this? Sure. So the general risk of contracting Neisseria meningitis if you come in contact with somebody who's the sick is one generally thought to be 1 in 250, which is fairly high. That is 500 to 800 times higher than the general population contracting this very same illness. It's an incredibly lethal and debilitating illness. A lethal yeah. illness, even with <clears throat> therapy, the mortality rate for Neisseria, Neisseria meningitis, meningitis is 10 to 15 percent. Mm -hmm. And if they come in uh, undiagnosed and later in the illness, it's, it's higher. And so it's very, it behooves us to protect those that may have come in contact with the patient. And generally do that through an oral prophylaxis regimen, mm -hmm. generally ciprofloxacin or rifampin are the most commonly uh, used. And if uh, you're really concerned, IV ceftriaxone could be given as well as prophylaxis. But generally it's oral ciprofloxacin or rifampin. And I myself have taken cipro as a result of coming in contact with someone who we highly suspected had meningococcemia and meningitis. Wow, I mean, this sounds like a big deal, you know. I mean, you're potentially gonna have to track down and treat maybe dozens of patients and people because you have this, these two patients, family members, as well as potentially anyone they came in contact to, and then multiple staff in the ER. So it does become kind of a big deal very it quickly. It does, you know? and fortunately, most of these, um, most of the time, if, you're, if the duration of contact is brief, your risk of contracting the illness is lower as well. So it's, it's great that not all these patients are, are going away with meningococcus as a result of coming in contact with the patients. Those like healthcare providers that uh, spend time in close quarters with these patients that are, are gonna be at greatest risk or family members that spend a lot of time with the patient. And so it behooves us to you know, identify these patients or their contacts, I should say, and uh, identify them and provide them the opportunity to take prophylaxis to prevent right. getting the illness. Yeah, you know, we hear, we hear this a lot, you know, from our hospitals and our infection control committees that we need to protect ourselves. Uh, but is it real? I mean, is it a real risk? Uh, is there any, I mean, is there real examples of how we as healthcare providers have been victimized or put ourselves at risk by not appropriately protecting ourselves? Sure, our first inkling or inclination <laughs> is to go and take care of a sick patient. That's what we do as emergency physicians. But failing to, to don protective equipment, personal protective equipment, uh, has led to many a healthcare provider getting ill, and some some examples include the SARS epidemic, where a lot of healthcare providers got sick, and most recently, uh, the Middle East respiratory syndrome, um, where uh, a number of healthcare workings, <coughs> including para one paramedic who mm -hmm. just passed away, who came in contact with the patient unbeknownst to them, thought they were doing their job, taking care of the patient, did not use adequate personal protective equipment, and ended up becoming a victim as a result of that. Oh, wow. So it sounds like this is a real issue that Absolutely. we really need to protect ourselves. Absolutely. Protect other patients by isolating these patients we suspect of being critically ill and as well uh, protect our families. You know, it sounds like we can kind of become ill ourselves and then transmit this, this uh, sickness ourselves. And I think it's also important, as I think you stated, Dr. Madhavan, to, to institute these measures early. Uh, you may not have the, the diagnosis. You may not have the results of your CSF culture. Uh, in front of you, but if you suspect it, then of course you would rather be cautious and protect uh, yourselves and your patients rather than kind of do so after the fact when significant exposures have already taken place. Sure, yeah. Good, all right, well, this wraps up uh, the first uh, case. Uh, so I hope this was a useful uh, discussion of these questions and we're moving along to the second fever case uh, in a moment. So thank you, Dr. Madhavan. You're welcome. Good.